you have had an amazingly interesting and diverse <laughs> career, have you not? That's one way to put it. I was elected to the Hawaii State House when I was 21. People asked me, they're like, oh my gosh, you're too young. Too young for what? I saw things that I had not been exposed to before. Tell me why you left the Democrat Party. My position is equality for all Americans. If this election goes in the direction of Donald Trump, would you accept a role in the administration? Tulsi Gabbard is an interesting American. You may know her because she's been in the headlines. She was a rising star in the Democratic Party. And then all of a sudden, stories started floating around that she, in fact, was a Russian spy. She wound up on something called Quiet Skies, a terror watch list, and had air marshals surrounding her anytime she flew, even though she is to this day a lieutenant colonel in the Army Reserves. She's been deployed, she's fought for this country, and she has left the Democrat Party. Spent some time as an independent within the last week she has declared herself a Republican. I'm proud to stand here with you today, President Trump, and announce that I'm joining the Republican Party. We sat down and talked about this really storied journey that she's taken that wound up with her being a Republican just in the last few days and how it all unfolded and wound up where she is today. Well, Tulsi, thanks for doing this. You have had an amazingly interesting and diverse <laughs> career, have you not? That's one way to put it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Were you the youngest person to ever be elected to Congress in Hawaii or one of the youngest? Uh, yes. I was elected to the Hawaii State House when I was 21. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been told I was the youngest woman ever elected uh, in the country. Uh, and then I was elected to Congress 10 years later. When you were elected in Hawaii, had you graduated from college? You had no, not. I had taken a break to help my mom. My mom had run for Board of Education. She was right. the first person in our family to run for office. And I was at a point where I was thinking about going back to school and potentially studying political science. And then there was an open seat in the, in the state house. And so it was like, all right, I can go and talk about it in a classroom or I can actually just go and, and do it and be in a position to help solve problems. And uh, I, I took that latter route and was elected. Were you opposed? Yeah, everyone else was very well established in their professions. It was interesting because they all took me for granted. When I knocked on their doors, they're like, oh my gosh, you're so young or you're too young. And uh, I, I just would respond and say, you know, too young for what? Do you want these guys who are in office now, who are retired and kicking their feet up on the desk and not actually doing anything? or? Do you want some fresh leadership and new energy and new ideas to actually get to work and, and deal with the challenges we have? Yeah. And you ran as a Democrat? Yes. And how long did you serve? I was there for one term. I was campaigning for re-election uh, when uh, na our National Guard Brigade combat team was activated for a deployment to Iraq. Yeah. I was in a medical unit at the time and was not on the mandatory deployment roster. They had somebody already filling the job that I was trained in. And my commander called me and he said, hey, congratulations, uh, you don't have to go. You can stay, keep campaigning, get reelected. It was not a contested race. Keep doing the good work and then you know we'll see you when we get back in a year and a half. I knew very quickly there was no way that I could stay home and watch them go. So I withdrew from my reelection campaign, volunteered to deploy, filled a different job that they needed filling and we were away from Hawaii for 18 months and we were in Iraq for almost for about a year in 2005. Yeah. It was an experience that completely changed my life. What was the lasting effect on you of, of being in that combat zone? There were really three major takeaways that I had from that experience was just uh, the impact of, of the loss of human life and, and how Every one of us knew that any day could be our last. I saw and learned things that I had not been exposed to before. We had politicians for fly in, take some photos with the troops and then fly out again. Uh, politicians who were very glad to get the photo op, but who very clearly didn't 
the lack of care and understanding uh, really, really was shocking to me. And then the third thing was was the being exposed to the war profiteering of the military industrial complex, uh, even just on our camp and, and the operations that were happening in that country <clears throat> was incredibly uh, eye-opening. And, and that whole experience is really, when I came back from that deployment, really felt compelled to find a way. And I didn't know exactly what it would be, but to find a way where I could take those experiences and try to affect those decisions being made about war and peace. You've advocated a, a non-interventionist foreign policy. Yeah. Fair to say? Yeah. Do you think those experiences there drive your non-interventionist foreign policy attitude? Yes. Yes, that, that was the beginning, and it caused me to really take a deeper dive into our country's uh, history and present day approach to foreign policy that has for too long largely been interventionist in the sense of let's go out and be the policemen of the world and go and topple dictators we don't like and protect the ones we do like and try to build little mini Americas around the world and not really making these decisions based on what is in the best interest of the American people and our security. How do you balance that against what some describe as a world's need for U.S. leadership around the globe? Yeah, this, this has been the problem with, uh, and it's not limited to one party, but it's really the uniparty of the war machine in Washington is that the way that they assume we must exercise that leadership is through the use of, of either economic warfare or dropping bombs rather than recognizing that peace through strength is multifaceted and requires the kind of direct engagement and diplomacy that we've seen over time from leaders like President Kennedy with Khrushchev and with Ronald Reagan and, quite frankly, with President Trump when he was uh, first in office. People have been critical of Trump now and others that I think practice diplomacy by having a relationship with dictators around the world, do you think that's a good thing or a, a bad thing to have a, a rapport with somebody like Putin? Supply chain issues are on the rise. Whether caused by natural disasters like hurricanes Helene and Milton, global conflict, or worldwide inflation, the impacts are being felt across the board. When there's an urgent need for essential items like medications, these delays can become catastrophic. In the face of disruptions and cutoffs, how will you care for yourself and your loved ones? The Jace case provides peace of mind for families during times of shortages, delays, and disaster. It's an emergency medication medication kit containing five life-saving antibiotics that treat the most common and deadly bacterial infections. By completing a simple online evaluation, you'll be prepared for the unexpected. Don't wait until it's too late. The time to prepare is now. Right now, you can receive a discount on your Jace case. Just go to jace.com and enter promo fill at checkout. That's promo code P-H-I-L at Jace, J-A-S-E dot com. Ensuring you have the right medications when you need them most. Do you think that's a good thing or a, a bad thing to have a, a rapport with somebody like Putin? It's a good thing. As our commander in chief, I would want that person to go and have a good rapport, to be able to pick up the phone and call Putin, call Kim Jong-un, call any leader in the world to advocate for our interests, for the interests of, of our country and, and our security. If you don't have that open line of communication, it's going to be very hard to, to deconflict those tensions and to have straight conversations about what's at stake and, and how to work through those things. Yeah. President Obama refused to engage with Kim Jong-un, refused. Yeah. And the, the reason his administration gave was we don't want to reward Kim Jong-un with a meeting with President Obama. And it just, it always boggled my mind because it's not a reward. It's about our president advocating for our best interest to try to de-escalate those tensions and at that time to work towards denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. Was that attitude that Obama displayed then 
Was that a cornerstone of your disillusionment with the Democratic Party? I don't know that I would say it's a cornerstone, but um, it was one of the many reasons over time that uh, kind of resulted in the conclusion of today's Democrat Party leadership uh, cares more about their own self-interest and their own power than they do the interests of the American people. How so? Well, I'll give you the first example um, that that I was confronted with as a freshman member of Congress. I was barely in office for, I don't know, six or seven months in 2013. And uh, I was a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. It was August recess, so all the members were back home and working in their district. President Obama said that he was going to come to Congress to ask for authorization to go and launch an attack uh, in Syria, the beginning of what would be another regime change war. Uh, I immediately went back to Washington. I did my due diligence and my research, and I came to the conclusion that, unfortunately, they had no plan for what would happen next. They had no plan for what would any kind of retaliatory act look like, either against us or our friends in the region. It was astounding to me that after so many years of Iraq and Afghanistan that they were saying, hey, we want to go drop some bombs in another country, and we don't think they'll respond. And I came out publicly against President Obama's course of action. I got a call within 24 hours, and their response was not, hey, we know you've been deployed to the Middle East a couple of times. We know you have this experience. What are your concerns? They were not interested in substance at all. They admonished me for having the audacity to go against my president, the president of my party. And that was all they cared about was loyalty to President Obama and the party rather than actually what's in the best interest of the people and why I came out with the position. Also, I saw how they were doing their best to try to limit my ability to have impact, in, which is why ultimately I decided not to run for re-election to Congress. I felt that when I would introduce legislation, they would not allow it to see the light of day and that I could have more of an impact outside of the House of Representatives at that time than I could within a party that was not interested in the fundamentals of what it means to be an active and thriving democracy. And how did that happen? What was the change agent? What pushed it off of what it was when you were enthralled with it, when you said, this is my home? What pushed it off of that? Like point where I saw and felt a major shift was when President Trump ran for office in 2016. I think it was already kind of starting to move in that direction, like I said, with President Obama's 2013 at that time, they, they weren't interested in having Democrats who disagreed with the president, uh, which was problematic in and of itself. And we saw the same under Republicans, under President Bush, that, that they wouldn't go against their president, even if they knew that his policy was wrong. We don't want blind followers of any political party. But the shift in President Trump's election uh, was very significant where all of a sudden, if any member disagreed with the Democrat Party, you were told, well, if you don't go along with us, then you're supporting Trump. You're supporting this dictator, they said, this fascist, and all of the names uh, that they threw out there. Uh, they threw out the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax. There were all of these different tactics that they were using to try to force this total compliance uh, really, really through fear-mongering. And this Russia, Russia, Russia thing, that splashed up on you. Yes, it did. <laughs> Where did that come from? It, it came from this, I was going to say it came from Hillary Clinton. She was certainly the most high-profile person to push it. But really, when you look now over time, it's something that comes from their tried and true playbook where anyone, because it's Donald Trump, it's Bobby Kennedy, it's me, it's you know even Elon Musk, they're trotting it out right now in this election. Uh, they did it with the Hunter Biden laptop. Any, it, it is the excuse that they use to try to discredit a person or information that they don't want voters to hear from or to see or be exposed to. And they came after you hard. They were coming spy this, that. What was your reaction when 
you realize there's a campaign here yeah. to paint me with this brush. Yeah. I had heard this stuff before. What surprised me was the day that I announced my candidacy for president, uh, that week leading up to it, we had heard from NBC News. They were asking some questions about like my associations with Russia or whatever. Like I've never been to Russia, I've never met Putin. I don't know what exactly they were talking about. And NBC News came out with this hit piece literally as I was walking up on the stage to deliver my speech. And it was a hit piece that planted the seeds for this, oh, there are some suspicious or potential nefarious associations with Russia or whatever it was. But that's what the article was about. They bumped it up so that it was in t it was released on the date. And that that's kind of what showed the hand of, okay, well, this is, you know, the legacy propaganda media of NBC is in on it. And then it started coming from a lot of different directions. And then Hillary Clinton brought it in. And it's so insane on its face because none of them asked Hillary Clinton for evidence or proof. And the thing that, that bothered me the most was that people believe this. And not, not a single one of them said like, oh, okay, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm still serving in the military today. I've been in for over 21 years. Not a single one of them said, hey, this is a member of Congress on the Armed Services and Foreign Affairs Committee who has access to the highest level of security briefings, who still wears the uniform uh, and is serving our country. Uh, Hillary Clinton, how can you call this person a, an asset of Russia or a puppet of Russia? Where's your proof? Because if you got proof, you better show up because if that's true, then I shouldn't have access to any of this stuff. Well, no. Never, it never, ever happened. I know why, but the problem was, and I, I had numerous interactions with voters as I was running for president who believed her. And they were so, like, great Americans who believed her. And when they met me, were so deeply troubled and concerned by this. Uh, this one woman in South Carolina, I remember very clearly, she's a local county chair of this very small rural Democrat party. We had like a town hall and a little barbecue shack in the middle of nowhere. And she came up to me with her eyes welled up with tears and she put her hands on my shoulders and, and told me how troubled she was to hear this. And she looked into my eyes, she said, Tulsi, are you working for Russia? And it just broke my heart to, to see the effect of their propaganda and how damaging it is, I mean, really to our democracy. That instead of us having a conversation of, of her saying, hey, let's talk about your, you know, your policy on healthcare. Let's talk about your policy and position on education. They plant these seeds in order to make it so that people are suspicious. And, you know, I, I gave her a hug and I told her, I'm willing to give my life for my country, this country. The problem was I couldn't, I couldn't have that face-to-face -face conversation and that hug with every single person right. who had heard Hillary Clinton's lies. You're a lieutenant colonel. Yeah, I'm a lieutenant colonel and a battalion commander in the Army Reserve. And did they ever come to you and say, we need to do some kind of investigation or some... Never. They never said anything. Never. And even most recently, in kind of one of the latest acts of political retaliation under the Harris-Biden administration, the very next day after I uh, criticized Kamala Harris in a live TV interview and warned the American people, as I did back in 2019 when she was running for president, I warned the American people about how dangerous she would be as commander-in-chief about how she would try to mask her insecurity and her weakness and, and try to appear strong as a commander in chief and prove her strength by using our military to accomplish that and needlessly putting people's lives at risk. The very next day after I did that interview, they added me to this uh, secret domestic terror watch list called Quiet Skies. And I was going through in-depth screening day after day after day. Every time I flew, it would take me an hour to get through TSA. I get the quad S on my boarding pass, couldn't check in online. It was like the full thing. And I just thought like, okay, something's going on here because this is not a random selection. Yeah, Every day, different Every airlines, day, different, randomly. no. But these air marshals came forward because they did not want to be used as pawns in what they clearly saw was a political attack. It's, you know, the military, again, we had members of Congress asking Department of Homeland Security, TSA, like, what are the grounds of you putting Tulsi Gabbard 
on a domestic terror watch list, having canine teams like looking around her every time she travels, three to four air marshals traveling with her and surveilling her every time she gets to an airport and leaves an airport and on the flights. Like, what are the grounds and basis for this? Because you're using taxpayer dollars. This is a serious thing. Right. Never a single piece of evidence put forward or any kind of justification. Members of Congress sent a letter to the, um, I think it was like the chief of staff of the army saying, if there is a real concern here, they placed her on this terror watch list. Have you been given any reason to investigate her? She's got a security clearance. What's going on? And uh, I, I got a copy of the letter that was sent back to this member of Congress saying, basically, no. We have no reason to have any concern. If there were, then we have the teams in place who would investigate someone who is in this position, and there is no evidence. Has anybody ever been held to account for that? No. Nobody's ever been investigated, reprimanded, said to produce evidence. Nobody's ever been censored, no nothing. No, and it's a very intentional tactic to criticize your opponent for doing the things that you are actually doing, yeah. to try to distract voters and foment fear and try to paint this picture of, of your opponent because you don't want them to see what you're doing in broad daylight. Freud called that a defense mechanism called projection, mm -hmm. uh, where you project your... Uh, issues onto someone else to deflect attention from yourself. We're seeing it, obviously, in, in their their uh, criticism. They're saying Donald Trump is the biggest threat to democracy, and, and yet they're the ones who tried to keep Donald Trump's name off the ballot in over 32 states. They're saying, you know, he will undermine the rule of law. Well, they're weaponizing the government against not only Donald Trump, but their political opponents. Uh, we're seeing it with the border. They're saying, you know, Donald Trump is the cause of the open border when actually, like, nope, you guys are the ones in charge and and you lifted all of the things that Donald Trump had put in place to secure the border. When you look at each of these examples, uh, they are doing exactly that. Now, when you say they, who are the they that, is this a nameless, faceless, committee of people? You've mentioned Hillary Clinton. Is it Hillary Clinton at the time? Is it somebody else at another time? Is it the power structure within the Democratic Party? Who's doing it? Who are the they that, is this a nameless, faceless committee of people? Is this, you've mentioned Hillary Clinton. Is it Hillary Clinton at the time? Is it somebody else at another time? Is it the power structure within the Democrat Party? Who's doing this? It's all of the above. You know, when, when you look at um, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris specifically, it's been clear for a long time that they are the figureheads. And there are, uh, you know, it's people like Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan and the longtime entrenched Washington establishment uh, that is calling the shots. And some of them are political appointees. Yes, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama. Some of them are within the national security state. Yeah. Um, it's very powerful people, both in the government and outside of the government, whose power is threatened by those who won't allow ourselves to be used as puppets and who have the courage to speak the truth uh, and expose them. How did this focus on you end? I mean, you left the party. Yes. Did it let up then? Did they no. say, okay, you got rid of her? Is it still going on today? It is still going on today. Uh, there has not been any kind of reprieve or break. And it continues on because, you know, I, I served in some of the highest positions in Democrat politics in our country. And I've seen behind the curtains when I first went to Washington, I was surprised because they were like, oh, she's the next rising star of the party and she'll be president one day and this is who's going to play her in the movies. And I did not expect it at all. And I realized that at a certain point that my bio kind of checked a lot of the blocks that that they thought were good for them. Yeah. And they just assumed that play I ball. would fall for the trinkets that they were dangling before me and think, oh, okay, cool, you're gonna give me all this, you're gonna roll out the red carpet for me, like, awesome, I'll follow along. But that, that's not why I ran for Congress.
at all. And so it was that first public expression of opposition to President Obama, specifically on a on a very real issue that was uh, related to why I ran for Congress in the first place that showed them like, all right, she's not just going to, you know, go along to get along, stick to the talking points that they provided. And it didn't take very long. I mean, it was the first time you raised your hand and said, well, wait a minute. Yeah. But when you first got there, you were the shiny new thing, right? Mm -hmm. So you were female, you were young, you were well-spoken. Veteran, were... woman of color, from the Pacific, all, all these different things. Yeah. So it's like, wow, we look what we have here. Yeah. But we didn't know she was going to think. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't know she was going to have a mind of her own. <laughs> yeah. Are you able to fly now? As of now, I've been able to travel without the in-depth screening. But uh, as of a few weeks ago, I heard this quiet skies domestic terror watch list is still active. So are you on the terrorist watch list? This quiet skies terror watch list. That's still a as deal. As far as I know. So when you left the Democrat Party, you, you became independent. Yeah. Are you now declaring yourself Republican? I am. And that's as of when? About a week ago. This is really recent. Yes. Okay. Why? Why go independent to Republican? The direction of the Republican Party has uh, changed significantly. Uh, it started uh, with President Trump's first term in office and has continued here in, in the last you know year and a half or so uh, into being what we now see, which is really the big open tent party. Um, the way that he welcomed Bobby Kennedy and me and Elon Musk and Danica Patrick, she's never voted in her life. And now she's coming out and she's supporting Donald Trump, really bringing people together, not because, you know, we all have passed some kind of arbitrary litmus test, but because we we are committed to and very passionate about the most important issues to the American people that are rooted in our Constitution and our Bill of Rights. You know, I've spoken about Donald Trump and did last night. And I said, I'm not here to stand up for Donald Trump. In fact, I don't agree with a lot of what he says or does, mm -hmm. but nobody, nobody agrees, agrees with everything or likes everything somebody else says or does. But you don't have to love everything about someone in order to love them. I'm here to stand up for all the people getting bullied and ostracized and canceled and attacked because they stand up and, you know, say they're going to vote for one side or the other. And I wondered how everybody would respond to that, because it was a very different speech, I think, than anybody else it gave. It was. And I wondered how that crowd would respond to that. Mm -hmm. And I said, if your neighbor says they're going to vote for the other side, you should say, hey, that's okay. I still love you. Vote how you want to. Vote your conscience. It's okay. I, I still love you. We're all Americans. Mm -hmm. And, and I, you I, got a big applause to that line. I did. If you were an American on 912, stand up right now. If you were an American on 912, stand up right now. That's who we were. That's who we are. That sold out crowd at Madison Square Garden. Yeah. And I saw Melania and, and President Trump after that. And they both said, you know, that was, that was great. You know, you're really calling for unity thing. here, and we love that. It was a powerful message that you delivered, and you're right. It stood out and was very unique and different from many of the other speakers, uh, and such an important one. Well, I, I think it's so important. That's why I referenced 912. Yes. Not 911, 912, because the morning of 912, there weren't any Democrat or Republicans. That's right. We were all Americans. Everybody was an American. Somebody had attacked us, all of us. And when I was in Carolina a couple of weeks ago, helping with the hurricane recovery, there were neighbors helping neighbors. I mean, I was in a basement shoveling out mud, and there were like 10 people doing a line of buckets going up the stairs. Nobody asked the person they were handing the bucket to, what's your affiliation, mm -hmm. what are your pronouns? Mm -hmm. They didn't ask you anything. It, they just ask, <laughs> just, hey, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And they all wore themselves out and sat under a tree together and talked. They were just all Americans helping a neighbor. Yeah. It was America at its best. Yeah.
And I just hope we don't have to have some seismic event to remind us again that we're all in this together. It's okay to have differences. I would hate if we were all of one mind. I, How boring I would know. that be? <laughs> and, you know, you've got to have flint and steel mm -hmm. to spark ideas. I, I mean, it's the I, same is true in just like your own personal relationships. Oh my God. I've been married like... 48 years. I would hate <laughs> to be married to me. Yeah, right. I want to be married to somebody who's or different. Or some robot that just says, yes, oh yes, my dear, God. yes, honey. Like that's again, where like, the things in our everyday lives that are real, where none of us agree on everything, but you, you love someone and you respect them. Even if you end up disagreeing and saying, you know what, got it, you're coming from a different place, that's your right. Yeah. But in the party that I left, uh, that was the way it used to be. And that is no longer, that's no longer the case. I never voted ticket. Right. I always voted policies and looked for who was doing what at a given time. But I've written a book called We've Got Issues, How to Stand Strong for America's Soul and Sanity. And I talk about the tyranny of the fringe. It seems like we've got these fringe factions, really on both sides, yeah. that have a big megaphone and talk about these extreme issues that are being pushed and it seems like the Democrat Party has really been hijacked by these extremists. There are just so many different examples of how big tech is is manipulating the information that we get access to to favor the Democrat candidate and the Democrat Party. We see the same thing in a lot of the legacy and mainstream propaganda media. We see a lot of the same thing from the national security state. It's all of these different powerful entities that that benefit from having these figureheads uh, who will do their bidding. And the fear that has been created, like I, I cannot comprehend still how not a single Democrat in the House of Representatives or the United States Senate and neither President Biden or, or Vice President Harris has taken a stand for Title IX and fairness for women and girls in sports and education. Not a single one of them has stood up and said, hey, this is wrong to have boys competing against girls in girls' sports. And, and I don't believe that, that they all have bought into the insanity of that viewpoint. They are just terrified to get up and speak the truth because they don't want to be called a transphobe. They don't want to be called a, you know, a bigot and all of the other names that they throw out there. Since you bring that up, You've had different positions on different LGBTQ issues, like gay marriage, and you've actually sponsored bills. You've then changed your position on that in the past. Where do you come down on gay rights issues? I'll ask that in a general sense as you sit here today. Yeah. My position is, is largely a libertarian position of equality for all Americans, however you choose to live your life, whoever you choose to love, uh, that's, that's up to every one of us to make those choices. One of the big impactful experiences that I had in how I viewed these issues uh, came through my deployments to the Middle East where I experienced and saw what it means for a government to try to act as the, you know, the moral arbiter for its people. And obviously it was very extreme in some of the countries that I was in. They had the religious police out there. They would not allow, you know, for celebrations or fireworks or music to be played on Christmas Day or, or on New Year's Eve. But really it, it came down to a conclusion that government shouldn't be in this business at all. Yeah. And at one point, I, I read a quote, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you had said that the Florida bill that is inaccurately referred to as don't say gay bill, because it doesn't say that anywhere, didn't go far enough. Did you say that? And where do you stand on those issues now? I'd have to go back and, and look at the details of that bill, but I think that what I was referring to um, was the fact that the legislation, I think, kicked in uh, around uh, middle school. My point in that statement was that this kind of sexualization of our kids 
does not belong in our public school system at all. Do you have a problem with gay marriage? Do you support it? I don't think the government should be in the business of deciding who gets to marry who. Uh, as long as the government is involved, it should be equal, whether you're straight or gay or... Yeah, and that's important for equally. reasons of insurance coverage. It really matters to yeah. people whether or not the government recognizes them as a couple or not. And you don't have a position to block that. No, of course not. Yeah, but at one time you did. A very long time ago. Yeah, that was back in the early... Probably 20 years ago. I've taken very strong and controversial positions about the Israeli-Hamas conflict and said that I think our elite universities are fostering intellectual rot by allowing or even fostering these demonstrations on campuses in support of known terrorist groups against a critical ally of America in Israel. I've interviewed Prime Minister Netanyahu about it, and I've seen these protests and demonstrations going on that tell me that we just don't have critical thinking happening on our university campuses. We still have American hostages being held. Yeah. What is your wisdom about this Israeli-Hamas conflict? Yeah, I've, I've been very outspoken on this uh, since that horrific attack on October 7th in, in a few different ways, uh, similarly talking about how the world should be paying very close attention to what's happening on our college campuses to recognize what this very real threat is, that that attack was not just the latest in the, the generations-long conflict between Israel and Palestine. It's the latest front of this objective that these radical Islamist terrorist groups like Hamas and Hezbollah and ISIS and Al-Qaeda and others around the world, their ultimate goal and objective is to establish a global Islamist caliphate and that we must all live under their Sharia law and that caliphate. Uh, when we look at the charter of Hamas, it makes it very clear that their goal is to exterminate the Jewish people and destroy Israel so that Israel no longer exists as a means to that ultimate goal and objective they have. Uh, this ideology is the greatest short and long-term threat to civilization in the world and freedom. And so when we look at what's happening on college campuses here in America and in different parts of the world, where we have college students who are chanting and repeating uh, Hamas's lines and refrains, propagating their views and fomenting anti-Semitism and in some cases, actually violent acts against Jewish Americans, we can see the threat that it poses. Yeah, it's hard to negotiate with somebody whose prime directive is that you be dead. Yes. And wiped off the face of the earth. And that makes it difficult to broker a peace. Yes. I've been to Israel and I've, I've been to the side of the Nova Music Festival and interviewed people that were there. And I've been to so many places that were attacked in, in their homes. And something that was a revelation to me is they were telling me that when Hamas invaders came in and they were hiding in their safe rooms, that what they heard through the door were Palestinian women and children ransacking their homes mm -hmm. out there. These weren't just Hamas militants, but Palestinian populace just coming through the hole in the fence and and just invading their homes, taking everything that they could get their hands on. It, it made me wonder if there is a line to be drawn between Hamas and Palestinians. It, it's hard to tell where that line is drawn. When I, I had multiple people telling me that. Yeah. Uh, and that's something I hadn't heard until I talked to the people that actually had their homes invaded. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the Palestinian people have been uh, also subjected to 
death and suffering under Hamas's rule. Yeah, people say, well, why don't they just kick them out? Well, it's a little hard to kick them out when they control the food, the medicine, the weapons. It's kind of like, yeah, say something about it, you're going to get shot in the head. So yeah. it's a tough situation. I think this is why the defeat of Hamas is so important Yeah, uh, on many levels. Well, Netanyahu may not be real popular in Israel with the people on a lot of issues, but I do believe he's going to finish that war. Yeah, He's going to finish it because yeah. I think he believes that if he doesn't, it could be the end of Israel. And he looked me square in the eye and said, I, with or without the international community, I'm going to finish this. Yeah. And I looked him in the eye and I saw resolve. There were more Jews killed in one day than since the Holocaust. He said, we didn't have the ability to fight back then. We do now. Mm. And we are now. Yeah. And I, he was very clear about that. Yeah. If this election goes in the direction of Donald Trump, would you accept a role in the administration? I would if, if it was a role that I felt that I could actually be be effective in, in helping to lead specifically in President Trump's goals and objectives related to our foreign policy and our country's security. I'd, I'd be honored to, to help bring about that change. When you listen to the kind of transformational change he's talking about, that Elon Musk is talking about, that you know Bobby Kennedy, myself and others are talking about, it's going to require a lot of leaders of courage. Uh, with a strong backbone to take on the entrenched bureaucracies and a uh, multitude of special interests uh, in Washington. Uh, it needs to happen. The American people deserve so much better than, than what we have. And uh, to be in a position to help carry that out, um, I'd be honored to serve. Yeah. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you, Phil. I appreciate it. See you. Thank Thanks. you.